Hi guys, it's Andrea, or Confessions of a Book Addict, and I just finished, um, Echobor, A Court of Wings and Rune, and it destroyed me in so many different ways. Um, Sarah J. Moss came through again on her, um, wonderful but heart-rending stories, and, um, if you haven't read... Court of Thorns and Roses. I highly recommend it, and this video will have a lot of spoilers if you haven't even read that. So, start with A Court of Thorns and Roses, which is based on, it's like a Beauty and the Beast retelling, um, and that one's okay, and then A Court of Mist and Fury comes after that, and it's just, that one's just amazing. That's one of my favorite books of all time now, and, um, you know, Rassand, which is what I call him. I'm going to get all the names wrong in this. So so when it opens, it opens from Rassand's point of view. It says two years before the war. So it opens up in war because they're at, they're at war with Highburn. Um, and it's kind of like the aftermath of a battle. So it's, it's setting the scene for what's going to happen later in the book. Um... Yeah, I'm really jumping into it. There's going to be spoilers throughout. And then it switches almost immediately to Feyre. And then it basically stays with Feyre um, all the way till the end, to the last few chapters. And uh, when we last saw Feyre in A Court of Mist and Fury, she had pretended to break the mating bond with, uh, with Rassand. That scene itself in A Court of Mist and Fury was just heartbreaking. They really just broke the the bargain that they had between the two of them. That's all that was broken. The mating bun was still intact. Um, so she could still, she went with Tamlin. She had to leave. She pretended that, you know, Rassand was, was, uh, brainwashing her and kept her against her will on the night court so that she can get into the spring court and act as a spy. So she did. She went with Tamlin and while she was there though, she was pretending to be subservient to, um, she was plotting against him and trying to get his court to go against him. And the only one who was kind of suspicious was, was Lucian. I actually feel really bad for Lucian. He's one of my favorite characters. I kind of hope, because towards the end of the book, he, he kind of disappears for a long time. I kind of hope she will do like a, a novella or something based on what was going on while he was gone. So she thinks that Lucian is actually Helian's son rather than Baron's son. Eris and Lucian's other brothers were constantly harassing him and and knew he was powerful and, and you know he wasn't first in line for the for the throne but them and their father were always against him so I feel like almost like Lucian's loyal to Tamlin even though Tamlin's the typical abusive boyfriend where he um He's possessive, and he's mean, and he gets angry really fast. And, you know, she had moved back into the spring court to stay with him, but she couldn't stay in her old room because it was destroyed. He had destroyed her room, ripped it apart when she had ran away. He was abused. He grew up abused by his brothers, by his father. So for Tamlin to act the way he did... It wasn't like a big surprise in Lucian's life. It wasn't like jarring to him. This is what he had grown up with. So the fact that he was loyal to Tamlin, to me, seemed to be almost, um, it seemed to make sense. Back to Feyre, though. She wanted to cause discord in Tamlin's court. She wanted him to lose power. And she wanted, when she snuck away, for them to feel he pushed her away. She also had to keep her powers hidden. She had received powers from all seven high lords, and they were not aware of it. You know, they, they, when it comes to Lucian and, um, Elaine, and Elaine is Feyre's sister, who, at the end of A Court of Mist and Fury, or close to the end, her and Nesta, who is Feyre's other sister, were thrown into the cauldron and came out from, they were humans, and they came out high fey. And they each had their own powers. Now, Nesta, they weren't sure what her power was. They just knew she was, like, um, hardcore crazy. But Elaine was just heartbroken because she knew she was engaged to a human before she got turned 
into a ha into a fae, and she knew now that that you know was over. And when this book is taking place, it is um, right when she was supposed to be getting married. And that person's name is Grayson, and he is not a nice character. He never accepts her for who she is now. He breaks her heart. He tells her, you know, he doesn't want anything to do with her. She starts speaking what sounds like gibberish. And it turns out her power that was given to her from the cauldron is she is now a uh, seer. So she can kind of see the future. Which I think Sarah should have brought that more into the story and used more. I honestly think, as you see as the book goes on, that Azriel and Elaine should have a mating bond. A lesser writer could have left out a lot of choices and a lot of options. Sarah covered all their bases. You know, you would see something happen and then you'd be like, well, why couldn't this happen? And she would then, you know, a page later, explain why that thing couldn't happen. So instead, I was like screaming and crying at the book for, for real reasons as to, you know, what's going on? You know, why is this going on? Rather than, oh my God, why is she so stupid? Why didn't she do something about this and, you know, X, Y, Z? Because she did, or she at least thought about it. Her characters, or especially her female characters, are very strong. King of Hyvern made a promise that if they could use the Spring Court in order to access the wall to the mortal lands, then they could, um, they would protect the spring court and they wouldn't hurt his people um you yeah, know obviously he lied but i think tamlin at that point he just wanted favor back so he went along with whatever the king of highburn was saying in order to get her back to him amarin who was kind of like an otherworldly person in a high fey body um she was remade by the cauldron Jorian was remade by the cauldron after being kept prisoner as an eye and a bone by Amaranth. So he's remade as a person and he becomes a commander in the in the, in Highburn's army. He's a human, you know. He's crazy for half the time. He's jealous of Miriam and Draken who have disappeared off the face of the earth. They really want their army because they're going the main point of the war is he wants to rip down the wall that protects the people from the Highburn country who wants to keep the, the mortals as their slaves. He wants to rip down that wall. So he has his niece and nephew, Prince Dagdon and Princess Brana. Um, they're trying to find weaknesses in the wall where they could put the cauldron once it's replenished and once it could work in order to um to bring it down the weak the wall she did escape from all of them she killed the prince and princess who basically remind me of the caros from harry potter they're like she chops their heads off so while they were all at the wall trying to find a weak spot um they had gone without tamlin and then they went with tamlin and eventually his sentries, so, um, something wrong, went wrong with his sentries, and he felt he had to punish them, and he did punish them. So then Favor starts turning his own sentries against Tamlin, and he then later on, ex like, explodes at her, like he did in A Court of Mist and Fear. She wanted him to blow up. She wanted the, the pity. She wanted the sentries to feel bad for her and kind of decide with her. She also had kind of taken the thunder away from Ionth because she wanted to make it like on the Saltus with the sun rising and it was going to, you know, make her glow, the high priestess glow. And she had marked with rocks where she was going to stand in order to make that happen. And Favor moved the rocks. So instead of Ionth standing where the sun was going to glow and make her shine, um, Favor was standing there. So the people around were, you know, saying she's not only curse breaker, but she's also blessed. Another big part of the story was that the King of Pyrant, Highburn, excuse me, 
had the cauldron, and the cauldron's basically like God. So, like, how we'd say, like, oh, my God, thank God. They would say, thank the cauldron. And it reminded me of God. It could make people. It could kill people. It could destroy their world. But if something happened to it, it could destroy them. It's a huge weapon. It's what they all want. They just... Hybern wants to use it to to destroy things and to take down the wall, which he does um, with the cauldron. And that's why the king of Hybern was trying to get Nesta from them. Um, because she was like a bell. You know, he knew that if she was with them, they would know what he was going to do, that he was going to use the cauldron, and when he was going to use the cauldron. So, when we get to part two, that's when, um, that's when Feyre has the chance to get away. And she's escaping back to the, to the night court. And she actually has Lucian with her. She saved Lucian. She was going, he was following, then he was getting attacked by Ions and the prince and the princess, the niece and nephew of the king of Highburn. And she saved him. Together they get away. At that point their powers were diminished. So they couldn't winnow very far. They couldn't, you know, go from one spot to another in a far distance. So they decided to go and sneak into the Autumn Court, which was Lucian's family's court. They were hiding, but Eris found them. So they needed to run, and they ran, and they winnowed, and they got to the winter court, and they got onto the ice, and they're trying to go across the ice to get away. They collapsed a cave first, um, blocking in his brothers, but they got out, and Eris came to the ice after that, and he started melting it, because in the autumn court they have the power of fire. But Feyre has the power of everything, so as he's melting the ice... She's then refreezing it so that they can get across. And that's when they found out that she had these these powers from all the High Lords. Um, and that's when Azriel and Cassian show up. So Reese was actually spying on the Mortal Queens, I believe, at this point. So they were the closest to her. So they came, and Cassian gutted Eris. It was great. He survived, but, uh, you know, he deserved it. Eris kind of became not a good guy later on. You know, his good quality was that he wanted to kill his father so that he would agree, he would agree to work with them because he then become the High Lord. Um... But he wanted to work with them in order to fight against the King of Hybern and nullify the cauldron. When she finally made it back to the night court, Sarah made it, you know, as new adult as new adult can get immediately. <laughs> so they were together again, and that's what kind of let the led to the the contentment. Which to me kind of, I like the drama, it kind of takes away from it. But it was so great to see Rassam back again and, you know, they were a family. And it felt like, you know, anyone could fit into their family. So when she got there, her sisters, her sisters lived in the, um, the House of Wind. So it was the house on top of the Court of Nightmares. And they didn't go anywhere. They didn't do anything. You know, like I said, Elaine was very depressed. Um, Nesta was not happy. You know, she's trying to protect Elaine. Especially when Lucian came, she really wanted to protect her because, you know, that's her mate. So he's trying to see her, and she, Elaine uh, doesn't want to see him at all. She's still in love with Grayson. And... You know, Nesta wants to protect her. She didn't give him a chance. But the mating bond actually was there to also help Elaine heal. And the more time that Lucian was allowed to be with her, there was one scene where he was, and it kind of brought her out of her shell a little bit. But it was only the one scene. They really didn't give them a chance. Um... 
Cassian and Nesta kind of, well, he flirts with her and she tells him off and that's just, that's fun. And then towards the end, it's just heartbreaking how their relationship develops and she learns to care for him and, you know, he disappears certain times and she's always looking for him. And then at the way in, during the full-out battle between the courts and Hybern, um, you know, Nesta saves him because the cauldron is directly going towards the, the Ilrian flyers, not the proper name, um, but the Ilrian soldiers, and um, she just screams out his name, screams it. And he falls out of line from the soldiers and goes and flies down to her. And so he's the only one who's saved as all the other soldiers are turned to ash and are falling from the sky in ashes. And it was just, it was heartbreaking. And look, I'm going to cry, but I won't cry. They have to get together as much of an army as they can. So they then have to work with, um, care, care. The, the Lord of the the night of the Court of Nightmares, and they need his soldiers, his what it's called, Darkbringers. And Moore is horrified because that's her father. So Moore is horrified that Rasan basically makes a deal with them, saying that Care and his people can go into Valaris. Um, he also made he also told the people in Valaris, you know, not to serve them food, not to sell them anything, not to do anything for them. You know, but she didn't know that in the beginning, and she was just horrified and basically felt violated because that was supposed to be her safe place. And it couldn't be her safe place if her father, who, you know, basically tried to sell her to Eris and, and you know, threw her away, um, was going to be there. So they go to the library to do research. And what they find in the library is Briaxis, who, who Sarah describes as basically the face of all fears, is what I get from it. Like, what, And he comes into play later on in the book as, you know, as a weapon, essentially. They they make a deal, though, with Braxis. She makes a bargain with them that they still have to live in the library, but they would give him a window so he can see the stars and the sun and the moon. And that's what he promised to fight in the battle for them, not hurt any of their own soldiers, just Hybern soldiers. And I picture him going through, like, and just, like, eating everybody. So it's funny how it's described, because you got him going through, and then you have the bone carver going through, who I picture, like, sitting there, ripping people to shreds and just, like, sucking on their bones. And then you have the weaver coming through, also, when they're in the big battle. And I just kind of picture her slowly going through and eating people. Whether that's true or not, I'm not sure. That's just what I picture. Um, but in order to get the bone carver, he wants Favor to bring him a mirror. Which looks like it's pronounced Ouroboros. And she finds out the mirror is almost impossible to get. Because when you look in it, you see your greatest fears. And the people who have tried to get the mirror haven't been able to move it. Because they basically go crazy from looking at it. So she's putting off that she doesn't want to do that. She feels like, you know, obviously she's needed in this war. So if she goes crazy, then, you know, they're missing a vital part of their team. So she kind of leaves the bone carver out of it, and she just makes the deal with Braxis for the time being. And whenever she would see the bone carver, she would see him as a young boy, and it turns out she was seeing him as her future son. All this time, Amran is trying to uh, figure out in this the Book of the Blessed how to use the cauldron to, to their advantage, how to nullify it, basically. They just want it gone. They don't really want to use it for themselves because they know how powerful it is, but they need to 
if they can control it, if they can turn off the power, they can shut down the power of the King of Hybern and all of his soldiers. So, where it really started picking up for me, and where I really started enjoying the book, was when they had the meeting of the High Lords. They sped up the meeting. So, it was Helion, you know, the King of Daycourt, um, Baron actually came, the, the, not the King, excuse me, the High Lord of the Daycourt, um, Baron from the Autumn Court, Reese from the Night Court, um, Tarquin from the Summer Court, then Tamlin comes, and the meeting kind of stops, because they don't trust him, because he was siding with Hyburn, and they're like, we don't want to talk about anything in front of you, we don't trust you, we don't want you here, and he's just being a jerk, he's basically saying, you know, that Reese and Favor are bad, because Favor was his, and, you know, he stole them away, and, you know, Again, the abusive boyfriend coming out, but this time in front of a whole group of high lords. So he kind of made a fool out of himself. So what they had to do was Reese and Favor kind of had to prove themselves. Because, you know, people are listening to what Tamlin's saying, and it's not the whole truth. You know, Reese had to tell them what happened while he was trapped with Emerus. Um, that he was forced to, you know, sexually please her and you know they made it sound like he was living the high life for 50 years when really he was basically being sexually abused for 50 years um and then in order to shut Tamlin down he was talking 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 you know um and Reese made it so he couldn't talk and that's when they realized how powerful Reese was in comparison to the other High Lords. And they started listening. And then Nesta came to explain what happened to her while she was in the cauldron. And then Favor showed that she had powers from from everyone. And she told her told them all her life story of how they were poor and how she had to protect her sisters and her father. And, um, you know, Baron from the Autumn Court was, was fighting her left and right. So, that's kind of how the meeting left off. Ilian was, was good. He went and he actually, him and, and Moore slept together, which made Azrael sad. And it kind of made Moore sad, too, which that comes up later in the book as to why. And it's actually very interesting because, well, I'll just say now what happens. Um, so, essentially, Moore is a lesbian. Um, but she couldn't say that. You know, she slept with Cassian to get out of the marriage with Eris. Because if she had said to her father, you know, care that she didn't want to marry Eris because she wanted to marry a girl or be with a girl, you know, in her words, she said he would have tied her to the bed. Um, so instead she made herself become, you know, unmarriageable in, in that society. So after the meeting, we go into, into part three, and part three is titled High Lady. And here, Elaine is trying to convince Grayson, um, to use their, what well, essentially is like barricades, they, they were so afraid of the Fae coming and taking over their land that they built. All they wanted them to do was take the humans and shelter the humans that were close to the wall. For if when the wall came down, or when the wall came down, um, they could be protected. They did not agree to that. So instead, what happened the night before the battle... It, you know, Reese and Azriel and anyone who could, you know, Feyre, they essentially used all their power and they went into the human homes and they winnowed them out of that mortal land into Valeris in order to keep them safe and away from Hybern. We get to the battle. The big battle. Um, Feyre felt was that, you know, when she was in Valeris and she had to protect the innocent people, she could do that. She could fight. 
But in this war setting, this, you know, battle of steel on steel and person on person, she she felt she couldn't do it. She goes away because she's looking for the Soriel, who is a great character who, you know, she gives her advice or he gives her advice, whatever it may be. Um, and she catches it all the time and she saved it. So they're almost like, they're almost friends at this point. You know, not really, but kind of. We're showing in the book that, you know, Cassian's getting wounded, and I'm just beside myself. You know, in my notes here, I write, if she kills Cassian, oh no, heck exclamation mark. Because I couldn't handle that, because he's such a good character, and I, he's kind of ripped apart, but he's saved, and he's in the thick of it, and no one can get to him, And but finally they do, they save him. And at the same time, Favor's talking to the serial. And she got information from him about, you know, a way to to um, unbind the cauldron, sort of. Um, he gives a hint from the Book of the Blessed of where to find this information. And while they're talking, the Soriel had been given a coat by Ianth in order to, to track the Soriel. And... Um, that the tracking would would start once she came into contact. I'm calling this Ariel she and he. I apologize. Um, but once once it came into contact with Favor, it would it would kind of activate a GPS type thing, you know, magical GPS. I need magical GPS for my car, but that's beside the point. Anyway, so Ian does show up while Favor's talking to the Ariel. And, you know, she's pure evil, as always, and she kills the Suriel. And this is the first thing that, like, really got me. Kind of the second thing, I guess, because at first, you know, you're thinking Cassian's going to die in the battle. But this is where the Suriel's dying. Suriel, you know, has been shot, I think, with an arrow, I think. Um, and... It's dying, and all it's doing is telling Feyre to run, to get away, and she didn't want to leave the Soriel alone. She didn't, you know, she wanted to be there as it died, and she was there as it, as it died, because she knew it was going to come soon. You know, she had said she'd seen enough animals to die to know when the body was going to get and that was just a touching scene because at that point they they had become friends, and um, in order to get revenge, the next part was was really good. Uh, they were in the middle, what's called the middle, and that's where the weaver is. So what Feyre did was she did she ran eventually she ran. And she ran directly into the weaver's cottage. And she held the door open. She didn't want to get locked in with the weaver by herself. She held the door open. And, um, you know, I wrote down classic Feyre. Because Ions follow her. And they follow her right into the weaver's cottage. And then, you know, Feyre rips herself out of there. And the weaver feeds on them, and all she hears is screaming and screaming and screaming from them. So Ian gets what she deserves. On page 565, I wrote, This book is trying to kill me with the feels. Because um, Reese was giving Azrael, you know, orders. And he, you know, what what Feyre said was formal, formal words, formal titles, because he's calling him Shadow Singer rather than Azrael, and he's calling him... High Lord rather than Reese, and it's kind of like they put on their they put on their roles. They had to do it. They're in war. They're in the midst of a battle, and it just showed how versatile their relationship is. The three of them, Cassie and Azriel, and Reese, and how close they are. That they're like they're like family. Well, they, but at the same time, you know, they respect each other and they work together. Up until this point, they didn't know what side Tamlin was on. And then he helped Azrael and Feyre 
and Elaine and this girl named Briar that they had saved. Because Azrael, he was wounded, his wings were bleeding, and he took Elaine, he got Elaine back. Um, they stuck in, they snuck into the Highburn's territory because they had taken Elaine, the cauldron had called her. Um, so they snuck into their camp and Feyre had, had disguised herself as Ianth and Azrael was with her, but in the shadows. So they did, they went in and they got Elaine and then as they're escaping, that's when the scene occurred where Favor's trying to fly. And Tamlin comes into play because what he did was he gave her a, a spring wind in order to lift her into the air. And it worked and she flew and she got away and then as she's in the air, she, she kind of makes a hole in the wards around Highburn's camp so that Tamlin could get out and then he could winnow away. They found Highburn's large army and they're about to go into it and Reese is acknowledging Reese is acknowledging everybody and telling them, you know, what they mean to him. That's what brings the characters because they're in the middle of this war, they're in the middle of all this, but they're still you know, well, they're fae, but they, they're still human. They still have emotions. And it's not just, here's action, here's action, here's action. There's, you know, these heartfelt moments scattered amongst all the action, but doesn't take away from the action. You know, in war, you have to plan. You have to set up a pl you know, like, oh, the, the Illyrian, again, I'm pronouncing it wrong, um, soldiers are flying, and these soldiers are here, and these soldiers are there, and da 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 And then, you know, Favor is like, oh, I never gave you a mating gift. I'm giving you one now. And she's got this tattoo down her spine, because she made bargains with, um, the bone carver, because she had actually, she, she had, she had met her fears, she looked into the mirror, and she got it for him. And the carver came because he didn't even want the mirror. He wanted her to prove that she was worth leaving his home for and worth fighting for. Essentially worth dying for. Um, so the carver's there, and then she had also released Briaxis. So there they are, like right in front of them. And then Reese is like, he's like, oh, here's my tattoo. I have a surprise for you. And he has the weaver with him. And it's like, what just happened? And um, so that was a little disconcerting because it's like you're planning a war and now you're just throwing in surprises. Like, you know, they need to know what's going on, but, you know, it is what it is. It's a good. It it. I liked it. It added a little, again. Added like a little humor in, um. Rather than just straight up action, which I appreciate. So, then, everyone starts showing up. You know, they bring those three characters in, and then. They're losing, they, you know, they, they're coming, and they're fighting, and they're kind of equal, but really not, and, you know, the three evil things, the weaver, the bone carver, Braxis, they're going against the army, and then they see all these boats coming, and they're like, we can't, there's, there's a whole nother army, we can't fight a whole nother army, and they basically, you know, they accept the fact they're gonna lose, and then they see... That it's Draken and Miriam coming. And then someone called the Prince of Merchants and his three ships. And his ships are called Feyre, Elaine, and, um, and Nesta. And it's their father who, you know, he had his legs smashed. And he really didn't do anything for them. And Nesta always held it against him. And he's leading the ship 
called Nesta, and he's coming up to help from the continent. And he was the one who actually found Vasa, the missing queen. Um, you know, Lucian comes along in there. He's kind of just thrown in there, which is a little weird. But um, that's why I think there's more to that story that needs to be told as to what exactly happened with Lucian. But their father comes... And he has, you know, they have all these boats. So now they have double what they need. And then on the hill, there's Baron and Jurian. And then everything starts happening all at once. Amran and Feyre go to the cauldron. Because Amran's like, okay, I looked at the Book of the Blessed. I have a way to stop the cauldron. So I have a way to stop the king. There's Feyre and Amran, and they go up, and she's like, Feyre, touch the cauldron, and she does, and it's pulling the life out of her, pulling it out of her, and Amran's just like, I'm sorry, and Feyre's like, what? Like, what, and I'm like, what? What just happened here? What do you mean you're sorry? You're, you're the good one. You're a good one, and then we cut to where, you know, um, Elaine and, and Nesta are fighting, you know, against the King of Hyvern himself. And, um, Elaine stabbed the king in the neck was because he had, he killed their father. He killed, you know, their father came to save them and he used their father against, against them, um, as like a hostage situation and then he, he did, he snapped his neck and dropped them. These girls who seem like they're, you know, powerless and, and overwhelmed by everything, they're the ones who kill the king. Um, Elaine goes after him, she, she stabs him in the neck, and then Nesta, she like, sticks her knife in and twists it, and it's gross. But anyway, she does that, and then she ends up cutting off his head. And Favor's kind of watching this from, in, not inside the cauldron, but almost like attached to the cauldron is what I picture. And the cauldron's watching it because, you know, Nesta's involved and sees Nesta. And then it's kind of brought back. After the king is killed, it's kind of brought back to the mountaintop. Um, that whole thing was a little confusing to me. It's, you had to use your imagination a bit with it, I think, which I did, but... It's hard to explain when it's just straight out of my head. What happened was Amran ended up doing an unbinding spell. And she got Feyre away from the cauldron and she threw herself into the cauldron. And Amran became light. So Amran herself, by becoming, you know, by going into the cauldron and becoming back to what she was... Before she was made into this fae, she could help, you know, destroy the army, which is what she helped do. Which is kind of when Vasa came too, and she was a firebird because it's daytime, and she was lighting all the, um, she was lighting all the boats of Highburn on fire. So then Feyre is trying to put the cauldron back together at this point. The king had died, everyone's attacked, and the whole thing with Amran in the cauldron, it broke into three pieces. So in order to do the unbinding spell for Amran, you know, they're trying to figure out how to fix, how to fix, how to fix the cauldron. And Feyre is like, Oh, I could do the opposite. I can do a binding spell. I could bind these three pieces back into one cauldron because when the cauldron split, you know, remember, the cauldron's basically like God, protects the earth, can destroy the earth, and it was starting to destroy the earth. So she's like, okay, the cauldron has to exist. It just can't be wielded, you know, for power. And that's what she does. She does this spell. She touches the cauldron, the pieces of it. She, like, holds it up what I picture like this in her hands and brings it together and it becomes, you know, the big cauldron again. And the world's kind of together, but in order to do that, she needs more power than she has. 
So she's she's holding on to Reese, and he's sending his power through her, and she's sending her power, their power, through the cauldron. And then there's the words, Reese is dead. And I'm like, I screamed. Like, I'm like, no. Like, no. Like, what are you doing? And Feyre just begs to the other High Lords, and she's... She's like, save him. Save him like you saved me. And they're like, but he's high fey. It, it's not the same as saving a human. Who, you know. She's like, please, save him, save him. And so they try, They all came. They gave a little piece of themselves. And she gave a piece of herself. And she's like, show me how. Show me how. And they did, they showed her how, and she got a little bit, and it's still, he was still gone. And she realized someone was missing, and it was Tamlin that was missing. So she goes, I'll do anything. I'll do anything you want. Just, just please bring him back. And so Tamlin does. He gives a bit of his power, and all he wants, he goes, just. Just be happy, Feyre. That's all he wanted, was for her to be happy. And then he comes back. Reese comes back. So Reese comes back, and then he goes, basically, like, she's leaning on him. She's listening for his heartbeat, and his heartbeat finally comes back. And he just comes back joking, you know, like, can someone get Amran out of the cauldron? <laughs> so she was back too, and that was amazing, and it's just, there was a happy ending. There's definitely other stuff that, that needs to be, you know, figured out, like, basically, like, what happened to Lucian while he was gone? Um, I know I keep bringing him up. I apologize. I just really loved that character. Um, you know, what's going to happen with the other mortal queens? There's there's four mortal queens left, I believe. Falls down now. What's going to happen to the to the people? To the mortals? Now that the Fae and them, you know, they still need to be protected from the Fae. And I love this book. It did have a slow start for me. It's, you know, you still got to be with your favorite characters, even during that part that was a little slow. So that was enjoyable. And then it was picked up, and it just picked up and picked up and kept rolling. The book was amazing. I mean, it's it's part of the Court of Thorns and Roses series, and the whole series is, is really, you know, well-written and really good. And this is a really long video, and I'm going to wrap up here.